Welcome, Emmanuel and friends, to our spring revival for the Emmanuel St. Leonard's Church. I am Pastor Trevor Donaldson, the pastor of the Emmanuel St. Leonard SDA Church. And if you are watching on YouTube, welcome. If you are watching on Facebook, welcome. If you are watching this as a rerun, guess what? Welcome to you as well. Welcome to our spring revival, where our theme for this particular week is unleashed. Oh, we're asking God to unleash us from anything that is holding us back. Uh, we want to be unleashed to be better witnesses, unleashed to be better Christians, unleashed from those weights and those sins that so easily beset us. Uh, and I want to encourage you uh, to come back night after night, because every single night we will be lifting up different areas of, of, of our lives in prayer. And so if you're going to miss any night, I'm going to just tell you, if you're going to miss any night, the night to miss is Thursday night. Why? Of course, because we will know we will not be here on Thursday night. We will only be here on Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and then on Friday night. And then in addition to that, I also want to tell you about a free Bible school that we have. Uh, if you're interested in Bible studies and in delving a little deeper in the Word of God, uh, we have Bible studies. And our, our administrator is going to put the link to where you can sign up to our free Bible studies in the chat. Uh, speaking of the chat, uh, we want you to, to interact with it a little bit. Uh, we want you uh, to, to engage with us there in the, in the chat. Even though we are not face-to-face, -face, uh, we want you to be interactive, uh, to tell us who you are. Uh, if our speaker says something that, that you agree with, please feel free to share it. The chat is your space. Uh, I don't know about you all. I am just so excited for the start of our revival week. Uh, we have some very powerful preachers uh, that will help us and encourage us all throughout the week. And, and as we navigate through this week, we are only asking one thing from you, one thing from you. And the thing that we are asking from you is to lay aside anything that can interfere during this revival time, because we have one mission this week. And that mission is by the end of the week, we want to be closer to Jesus Christ. Well, before we move any further, uh, we want to open with a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for giving us another day of life. Father, our needs this week are as different as our faces. They are as different as the homes in which we are partaking of this revival service. But the good news is that you know what all of our needs are. But more importantly, you know specifically what we need to take us to that next level. And so, God, we just ask that you would begin the unleashing process tonight so that by the end of this revival series, we will be able to say that we have grown deeper in you. And we ask all of these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Let everyone say amen. Well, my friends, it is my honor uh, to introduce to you our speaker for this evening, a, a family friend, 
uh, of mine. He, he is none other than Dr. Kenneth Manders. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Manders currently serves as the president of the Bermuda Conference. Uh, he is a graduate of Oakwood College, now Oakwood University, uh, where he received a BA in theology. Uh, Dr. Manders also graduated from Andrews Theological Seminary, where he received a Master's of Divinity, as well as a doctorate in church leadership. The Lord has tremendously blessed Dr. Manders to preach all over the world and all across these United States of America, uh, baptizing men, women, boys, and girls into the kingdom of God. Uh, Dr. Manders, he, he loves his family. He is married to his wife, Claudette, and from their union, they have been blessed with three wonderful sons, Andre, Stephen, and Joseph. But above all else, Dr. Manders loves Jesus Christ. And after our special music, the next voice that you will hear will be none other than Dr. Kenneth Manders.
storage is empty, but I'm available to you. Thank you for that song. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Pastor Trevor Donaldson, for the gracious invitation to be in worship with you guys there at Emmanuel St. Leonard Church. Uh, we want to thank God for this marvelous opportunity that we have to be in worship with you at the beginning of this revival. And um I trust and pray that as we enter into this experience that we would indeed be revived by God's spirit. I'm just excited about the opportunity. I um, am sitting here um, blessed, highly favored of the Lord and thankful for his, his um, presence in my life. And I trust and pray that you are coming to this platform like I am, um, wanting to hear God's voice and to be led by his spirit and to be filled each night and um, to be drawn closer to him. I want to commend your pastor and leadership of your church for the, the theme of your meeting, Unleashed. I love it, Unleashed. Um, I see you, Dawn. <laughs> Good to see the Donaldson family. Want to thank God for my friends there. Um, we are connected um, as brothers and sisters in Christ and it's good to know that you can be miles away from home and still be at home. And the Donaldson family have embraced me and my lovely wife, Claudette, and we wanna thank God for um, Dr. Jean Donaldson and um, Pastor Trevor Donaldson and the entire family for your love and your ministry toward us over the years. Um, thank you so much again for um, giving me the opportunity to share with you. I am new to StreamYard. I wish I could see some faces in the place. And um, But God's promise to be with us tonight and um, with his presence and with his permission and with his spirit, I trust and pray that we will hear what the spirit has to say um, to our hearts tonight. <clears throat> Before we go into the message tonight, let's have a word of prayer. In fact, let's read a text of scripture that I would love to read in your hearing. Trust and pray that if you have your tablet, your phone, or your Bible, <clears throat> that you would join me in the book of Revelation, chapter one. One of my favorite um, passages of scripture, Revelation chapter one. And I wanna turn our attention to verse 18 and then skip over to chapter two and we want to read from chapter two, one or two verses there, eight and nine. But let's begin with Revelation chapter one, verse 18. The Bible says, I am he that liveth and I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. And then chapter two, the Bible lets us know in verse eight, John writing to the church in Smyrna and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. You're poor, but you're rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil will cast some of you into prison that, he, that you may be tried, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. I will give thee a crown of life. I am he that liveth, was dead, 
and behold, I'm alive forevermore. I've tagged this text tonight because he lives. Because he lives. Let's pray. Father, take now lips of clay. Speak a word to your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Today, I shine my sermonic spotlight on this text, which lets us know that we serve a risen Savior. That he is the resurrection and the life. That in scripture, he is the source of life. He said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And because he lives, we too can have life. He told the church in Smyrna, I can bring you back to life. That's revival. Because he lives, nothing can stop him, block him, or hinder him. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against him. See, in scripture, God is relentless in saving us, for our sin could not dissuade him. The Sanhedrin could not silence him. The cross didn't intimidate him. And the grave, come on somebody, couldn't hold him. You talk about unleashed. The church is alive because of him. And we celebrate him because he is not stuck in a tomb. Is there anybody glad that he moved from death to life, from tragedy to triumph, from defeat to victory? And that's why the church lives, because he is alive. And that's the message of the church and the message of my, my sermon tonight. With his victory, he has lifted our humanity to a whole new level so that we can live and move and have our being. Christ told the church in Smyrna, who were going through it, your story is not over, your future is not failing, and your fears are not final. Why? Because the same omnipotent spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you. That's why the Apostle Paul said, oh, that I might know him and experience the power of his resurrection. See, because he lives, you can break out, you can break through, you can overcome. He told the church in Smyrna that because I have overcome and have the keys, you too can have victory. And that's good news. That lets me know that mountains can be made low. Crooked places can be made straight. Doors can be opened. Habits can be broken. And so we don't need to allow the devil to tell you that your life is over and that you are defeated. You are not defeated because Christ is a risen savior. You are not stuck or defeated and your life is not done. I'm not sure who I'm talking to tonight, but I meet all kinds of people who feel stuck in life, stuck like Chuck, stuck in graves of failure, disappointment, and despair. And I guess we've all felt stuck at some point in our lives. You love God, but you feel stuck. You give God praise, but you still don't feel liberated in your situation. Stuck in your circumstances, stuck in dysfunction, stuck in disappointment. But I walked up in here tonight to fight with you in your frustration and to war against your resignation and to encourage you to not let the uncertainty of your today shake your faith in what God's going to do. Even though you may not see yourself moving forward, sometimes in the natural You've got to still believe that God is still moving in the supernatural on your behalf and that everything you've been through is only preparing you for where God is taking you. That no matter the crisis, 
the challenge or the catastrophe, Christ to a church facing death, because I live, you too shall live. See, he gives us spiritual life. And that's a quality of life. It's the abundant life. It's vibrant life. And why is that important for us to understand? It's important because God does not want us to live lives defeated, depleted, and deleted. He never meant for us to be broke, busted, or disgusted. He never meant for you to be frustrated, irritated, or aggravated. He never meant for you to be empty, heartbroken, stressed out. He never meant for you to be suppressed, oppressed, depressed, or repressed. Because Jesus won the battle, he wants us to know that we can win too. And let me say this, his victory over the grave was not just a marginal victory. Oh no, it was an audacious, dynamic, death-rattling, grave-shattering victory where no plan could preclude it, nobody could destroy it, no demon in hell can deny it. We live because he lives. And this is the gift that he wants to unleash upon the church tonight. And you need to know that that kind of power is, number one, available. That's right. Put it in the chat. I said it's, un it's available. See, when Christ told his church that he was dead and is alive, that word goes beyond Easter celebration. This text celebrates for us spiritual life. See, it gives us this kind of hope to let us know that his resurrection is God's confirmation that in spite of the intimidation of your present situation, that God has no hesitation securing your salvation. See, Jesus Christ won the victory for us. And, and, and because he won, we also win. Now, over here in Bermuda, I must confess that I am learning more about the NBA, especially with the playoffs going on right now. And those of you who follow sports, you know that often a team wins, not because the whole team is awesome, but because of the presence of star athletes. I'm going somewhere. Every member of a championship team does not make the same contribution. You know it's true. I, I mean, LeBron will tell you that. Kobe, the late Kobe Bryant has demonstrated that. Uh, KD is in trouble right now. I'm sorry if you're a Nets fan. Let me go back to an era when I first saw basketball. I was watching The Last Dance as a lumber game just went off on my television. The Last Dance. And the coach, Steph Kerr, was asked by a player, as a player rather, when he was playing for the Bulls, what is the most unique thing? about your team after winning five championships. And he stared as if he was trying to gather an answer. And then he said it. I heard it just this evening. He said it. And I put it in my notes. He said, I guess we have Michael Jordan. <laughs> Probably without question, or arguably the GOAT maybe of all time in basketball. Why? Because he was better than everybody that came before him, to my understanding. And he has set the standard for everybody coming after him. But the one thing I liked about watching Jordan was this, that no matter how behind the bulls were, they were to put, if they were to put Michael Jordan back in the game, a comeback was inevitable. Oh, I'm, can I preach that? And I want to tell you that our humanity was far behind on points. Weak, wounded, and weary. You could say we're in the fourth quarter, down to the two-minute buzzer, but God called for substitution, and thank God he put Jesus in the game. And I want to say to you tonight, a comeback was inevitable. He defeated death hell and the grave and became responsible for our victory. And because we have accepted him as our victory, we are on the winning team. In fact, to help you understand this, 
in the award-winning novel To Kill a Mockingbird, Harper Lee, one of the main characters, is a little girl. There's a little girl by the name of Jane Finch. Her dad, Audacious, was a lawyer and a man of character. One day his daughter came home and shared with him some problems she was having with her teacher and some classmates at school. But to broaden her understanding and to help her manage the situation that she was in, her dad gave her some sound advice. She said, he said, baby, listen, you got to, you got to learn the trick. You got to learn about life. And he said, um, in order to get along with all kinds of people, you've got to really understand, you never under, really understand the person until you climb in their skin and walk in their shoes. I just told you something that's just now. I need you to know something. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He, he, he climbed in our skin and he walked in our shoes and, and he came on pavement level, dropped himself 40 and two generations to go through what we go through, to understand our pain and to overcome where we fell down. I'm so glad that he came in our hood uh, to pay a debt that he didn't owe because we owed a debt that we could not pay. And, and aren't you glad that he left perfect celestial and assume the pain of the terrestrial, that the God above us came to walk with us because he is for us. See, Jesus Christ is, was our proxy in birth, life, death, and resurrection. And that's why I want to say to you and not miss it, his victory is our victory. I hope you understand that. See, this is illustrated further in the Old Testament in the story of David. You remember David? He is seen in this picture representing the entire nation of Israel when he went to battle in the Valley of Gath against the Philistine giant Goliath. He stood alone on the battlefield, but when God gave him the power to overcome that giant, his victory became victory for all of Israel. When he won, Israel won. Come here, somebody. Because this is true of Jesus. Jesus died alone on the cross of Calvary. Three days later, he rose from the grave. But his victory over sin, death, and the grave is our victory. Let me help you illustrate this or understand this some more. They tell me that Andrew Jackson on May 1812 had 5,000 men from a ragtag rag -tag team army of Kentucky and Tennessee. They defeated the city of New Orleans in the war, opposing British troops, some five to 8,000 British troops who were considered at that time the best army on the planet. But in the battle, only seven of Jackson's men were killed while several hundred British soldiers were killed. Watch this. Only six of Jackson's men were wounded, but 1,400 British soldiers were wounded and 500 were captured. Now, that was remarkable. And that's what propelled Andrew Jackson to national prominence and ultimately to become the president of the United States. But watch this, folks. The outcome of that battle did not determine the outcome of the war of 1812 because a peace treaty had already been signed two weeks earlier, but because they didn't have WhatsApp and text messages and email, the news traveled so slow and the word didn't reach the city of New Orleans. And even though the victory was already secured, they fought as though the outcome of the war depended solely upon him or them. Even if Jackson, what I'm saying to you is this, even if Jackson lost the battle, he already won because while the battle went on, the war was already over. Did you get it or did you miss it? See, if you came here this tonight, I want to tell you that you may be in the midst of a fight, but I need you to understand that over 2,000 years ago on a cross called Calvary, the war was actually ended. And even though we still, the battle still rages, it has already been fought, 
The victory has already been secured. The door has already been opened. The way has already been made. And that's why we are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory because Christ has unleashed the power of God and it's available to every trusting child. That's why God sent his son as a guarantee that you can win the prize of eternal life. His spirit is available tonight. But that's not all. Not only is that power and that spirit available, and thank God it's available. I said it's available. I said the power is available. There is power, wonder-working power in the blood. Tonight, victory is available. Somebody ought to praise God for that. No matter what your situation, God's power is available. But secondly, not only is it available, watch this, it's accessible. Now, there are some things that are available but not accessible unless you have the code or the key. Mm -hmm. For the Christian, faith is your access code to resurrection power. Yes, it is. Faith is that gift that makes what is available accessible. See, right now, I'm in a room, and so are you, where there are Wi-Fi signals available and accessible right here, right now, but one cannot benefit from them unless you have a device that is Wi-Fi enabled. Right now, the power of God, the presence of God, the provision of God, the peace of God is likewise available to every one of us. But in order to access it, you've got to have faith to enable it. No wonder 1 John 5, 4 declares, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So whilst the power is available, it is accessible by faith. Faith is, gives you access to the power of God to remove difficulties that oppose the progress and the growth of God's children. But you need to know, there is no limit to what God can and will do for those who depend on him, trust in him, wait on him, and rely on him. And I read somewhere that when human effort is connected to divine power, you can do deeds of omnipotence. You talk about being unleashed. Your weakness is a perfect match for God's strength. The one that Paul said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, he had faith in order to access that kind of, kind of power, and we must have faith too. And I can hear your question coming through right now. What then is faith? One writer has said faith is not optimism, although it is optimistic. It is not cheerfulness, although a man or a woman of faith is more likely to be cheerful. It's not a sense of well-being, but faith is confidence in God's self-revelation. Faith is taking God at his word. Faith believes in God that he will do what God said God would do. The great theologian Augustine said faith is acting on what God said until we see it come to pass. Yet another, Manly Beasley said faith is acting so when it ain't so in order for it to be so because with God is already so. <laughs> faith, someone else said, is functioning like it already happened before it happens until it happens. I like what Jesus said. He said, when it comes to your eternal destiny, when it comes to the things of God, when it comes to things of God that are available and accessible, he said, Whatever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them. And watch this. You shall have them. Believe and you shall receive. That word receive in that text in the Greek is in the aorist tense. Thank you, Dr. Malongzang. 
The aorist tense, which indicates that one considers what they are asking for as though it has already been received in that moment. Did you get that? They have not yet received it, yet they are receiving it as though it has already happened. Let me break it down afresh. Faith is moving to the reality that God said it. I believe it. It's mine right now, even though this moment I may not possess it. One demonstrates faith when we are willing to trust God to open the way for, for him to accomplish his purpose in us. Faith is trusting God, relying on him to exercise his promise of fulfilling his power. So when we come tonight with a theme called Unleashed, I have a strong feeling, Pastor uh, Trevor Donaldson, that that theme is ready to be activated in the Emmanuel Church to every believer. Faith, one writer said, is a personal dependence, watch this, on the adequacy of God's grace. But faith is not mere passive dependence. It reaches out to grab God's promise in response to God's invitation, and it appropriates his grace into the life. Faith is seen when one puts their trust completely in God and relies on him. Faith is trusting God, believing that he loves us, knows what's best for our good. It is this faith that allows us to see what is possible. But let me move on. I have found that many people, instead of operating in the realm of faith, have many challenges because they are in dialogue with their doubts while they dismiss a conversation with their faith. And I want to say to those of you who are on that side, can you show me anything that doubt has accomplished? Doubt never charted an ocean. Doubt never tunneled through a mountain. Doubt never constructed a highway. Doubt never built a school. Doubt never completed an education. Doubt never raised up a church. Doubt never won a soul to Christ. Doubt just doubts. It cannot attain or obtain. It can only complain. It cannot conceive or achieve. It just doubts. Doubt just doubts. But faith will get you a victory because by faith, Abel offered a sacrifice to God and he received it. Nor by faith, built an ark, and his family got saved. By faith, Abraham went seeking for a city, and he will be in the kingdom of God. By faith, Jacob wrestled down an angel and got a name change. By faith, Joseph rose from the pit and went to the palace and dreamed his dream. By faith, Moses took a rod, split the Red Sea, and made a highway out of nowhere. By faith, Joshua walked around the walls of Jericho until they came tumbling down. And by faith, Jesus died a tragic death on Friday, rested on Sabbath. But early Sunday morning, he got up from the grave with the keys of death, hell, and the grave in his hand with all power. And that power has been unleashed for God's children. So faith is your access code to the power of God. Is there anybody? ever tried him and tested him and found out that faith in God makes you come through? That with faith in God, you have found out that God is dependable, reliable, available, unstoppable, and accessible? I like what one man said. God is like Coca-Cola. He's the real thing. Like Ajax, he's stronger than dirt. Like Adidas, impossible is nothing to him. Like American Express, you don't want to leave home without him. Like Visa, he's everywhere you want to go. Like Scotch Tape, you can't see him, but you know he's there. Like GE, he brings good things to life. Like Bear Aspirin, he can take your pain away. Like Nationwide, he is on your side. Like the Energizer Bunny, he just he will keep you going and going. And like Delta, he'll keep you climbing higher. 
And I like this one. Like Timex, you can take a licking, but keep on ticking. Can I get a witness in this place? That you have found out that God is not only available, but his power, praise God, is also accessible. But thirdly, his power is not just available and accessible, but it is abundant. God gives us power to fulfill his mission in our lives. Now, many people may judge you and feel that you are deficient, but when Christ activates that power in your life, I have found that he, he gives you the abundant life. That's right, a quality of life. That word abundant in the Greek comes from a word which means superior in quality, exceedingly above measure. It's the same word that Paul used in Ephesians 3, where he wrote, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask, think, or imagine, that power can work in us. That's the magnitude of the power that we have been given. And that's the quality of life that God wants us to have. It's a life that no money can buy, no person can dispense, no opposing force can conquer. It's a life of hope and joy and vitality. It's not dependent on circumstances or dictated by your situation. It is victory beyond failure. It is life without limit. It is life at peace with your past. It's active in the present and optimistic about the, about the future. It is a quality of life that helps you to love the unlovable, gives hope to the hopeless, friendship to the friendless, and encourages those that are downcast. Do you have that kind of life? And the Bible lets me know, he that has the son has life. And I want to thank God for that kind of power that's available tonight through Jesus Christ. What I'm trying to tell you and what I believe the Bible is telling us is that he wants us to live the abundant life. When the power of God is unleashed upon us, he can take nobodies and make them somebody. I just feel the need to testify. I just came back from Oak Woods alumni. I had the privilege of speaking on Friday night. I well remember leaving school before graduation. Let me be honest. I didn't leave. They asked me not to come back. I was not interested in school. I had one thing on my mind. I was going to grow dreadlocks and smoke my ganja, and I would be fine. We, we worked in a leather shop where we not only sold leather goods, but we sold greens and things that may have gone over your head. And so when I got the call of God and came into the church and felt his hand on my heart leading me and guiding me, I felt an inadequacy about going back to school. And someone came to Hamilton Church and read a powerful quotation. And when I heard that quotation, I said, Spirit of God, if you are calling me back to school, a dropout, I don't have a GED, didn't finish high school. My brains had been cooked, stewed, baked, boiled, and fried with ganja. I had no interest in school. But God, when God puts his hand upon you, he gives you power that's available, accessible, and abundant. I didn't do too well in school, but God was calling me. I heard this quotation. It goes like this. Prayer is the answer to every problem in life. Because it puts us in tune with divine wisdom, which knows how to adjust everything just perfectly. So often you and I do not pray in certain situations because from our standpoint, the outlook is hopeless. But watch this. Nothing is impossible with God. Come on, somebody. Nothing is so entangled that it cannot be remedied. No human relationship is too strained for God to bring about reconciliation and understanding. No habit is so strong that it cannot be broken. No one is so weak that they cannot overcome. No one so ill that they cannot be healed. And here it is. This is what got me signed up for Oakwood. No mind is too dull that cannot be made brilliant. Huh. Then it says, whatever is causing worry or anxiety let us trust God 
to give us the power. If anything is causing worry, stop rehearsing the difficulty and trust God for healing, love, and power. I packed my bags and I headed to Oakwood. I got accepted. That's right. That's how the roster became a pastor. When I got to Oakwood for orientation, one Linda Webb stood up in Moran Hall and she said, before I give you instructions for your journey, I just want to read something for your encouragement. You know, that quotation that that pastor read that day, I had it in my pocket as a promise of God to me personally. And before she gave us instructions, she said, I want to read something to you. She said, prayer is the answer to every problem in life. Because it puts us in tune with divine wisdom, which knows how to adjust everything just perfectly. So often you and I do not pray in certain situations because from our standpoint, the outlook is hopeless. But nothing is impossible with God. I don't know what I was doing at Oakwood. I just felt the call of God on me. They put me in a little class and said, the teacher said, listen, I want you to write a paragraph of your summer. I said, a para what? A paragraph. I scratched something on that paper. The teacher didn't tell me at that time, but three years later, in English 103, Dr. Derek Bow told me the story. He said, come on here. He said, man, when you showed up in my class and wrote that thing on that paper, I took that piece of paper. I marched myself straight into the president's office at Oakwood College. I slammed it on the desk and I said, who let this man in here? He said, but three years later. I know that there is a God somewhere because there is power available to crack open and kick open dead brain cells. You can't tell me that God is not a good God. He is available. He's accessible. His power is abundant. I graduated from Oakwood. I was on the honor roll, the dean's list. I graduated magna cum laude. I went on to get my MDiv, and now I've got my doctorate. Not because I'm so smart, but there is a power that is available that has been unleashed that if we would put our trust in God, he can fulfill his will in our lives. I can. hear somebody. You ought to give the Lord a hearty amen, everybody. So he's not just available and accessible and abundant, but he's also He's, he's abundant. He, he's, a, he's more than enough. He's abundant. That's right. And, and so I, I just want to say this. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, he says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The word gives in that sentence is in the present participle, which means that our victory is not just something that happened in the past. Don't miss this. But it's something that is happening in the present. We didn't just win back then. We are winning right now. So my testimony of yesteryear is one thing, but let me tell you something. God is doing a new thing in my life every day. And he does it over and again because the power is available, accessible, it's abundant, and it's active even now. Right now, in your present situation, it is available. His presence, his power, his strength is available to us right now. And that means that it's never too late for possibilities. It's never too late for you to start over. You've never gone too far to, to be redeemed. You're not too dead for a resurrection. You're not too lost for restoration. You're never too flawed to be fixed. You're not too broken to be healed. Because his victory guarantees that we can live. And because he lives, we too can live. His victory enables us to live without worry, fight without fear, suffer without despair, struggle without depression, die without doubt, and you can walk out of this platform and know that God will one day dry your tears and save your soul. I'm so glad tonight that he is who he says he is. And tonight, by God's grace, I trust and pray that you and I will determine by the grace of God that this week, will be a week that we will taste and see that God is available, accessible, abundant, and that he abides. That's the last word I want to say to you. It's present tense. 
he abides. Right now, he abides. So tonight, I want to close and say this. You have resurrection power as a believer on your side. Because God is your father. Christ is your savior. The spirit is your power. The church is your family. Faith is your victory. Grace is your helper. Heaven is your home. So if you got a problem, you can solve it. If you got a grudge, you can drop it. If you got hatred, you can dismiss it. If you've got a habit, you can break it. If you got a challenge, you can meet it. If you got a cross, you can bear it. If they talk about you, you can keep on praying. If they lie on you, you can keep on loving. If they press you up against the ropes, you can come out swinging and if they kill you you can get up on resurrection morning song says he lives he lives christ jesus lives today and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known the power has been released it's available, it's accessible, it's abundant, and it abides. And tonight, why not ask in all humility, God, help me to be available to you as was sung tonight. Help me to drop my doubts, my fears, to come to you empty and allow you to unleash your power in my life so that my habits can be broken so that whatever is hindering me from being all that you want me to be can be removed so that you can make me what you want me to be let us pray father tonight we thank you that we serve a risen savior that he's in the world today thank you lord for the provision of your grace and power Thank you for resurrection power, dynamic power. Activate that power and promise in our lives tonight. And may this week, may you unleash your power in our lives and give us the victory that you've already gained on our behalf. We thank you. We claim it. We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So much for that powerful, powerful word because he lives, reminding us that God's power is accessible, it is available, it is abundant, and it abides in our lives. I can tell from the chat that the word was well received and that people's lives were changed. Thank you so much for sharing of that powerful, powerful message with us. Well, friends, uh, I mentioned at the beginning that every night that we are going to have a special topic for prayer. And so every night you want to come out uh, because you don't know when the topic that you need will be uh, the topic for that particular evening. And tonight's topic, we are going to pray for our nation our leaders, and our world. All you have to do is look at the news and you can see that our world is in disarray. And so at this time, Elder Levi Harad is going to come on and he is going to lead us in our prayer for tonight. Let us take our prayer posture this time. Father God, we thankful first of all for the word we hear tonight. And Lord, we want to pray for this nation, Lord, uh, the political discord, the social divisions, Lord, the racial discord, Lord, and the continued inequities among people, Lord. We want to pray for peace, Lord. We want to pray for justice, that our nation may live up to the Constitution in which it was written, Lord. We want to pray also for, Lord, those uh, countries, those cities, those states that are experiencing natural disasters and fires and tornadoes and flooding across the world, Lord. We ask that you bless and bring relief, dear God, as only you can 
We pray for nations local experiencing drought and disease. We ask that you bring healing, Lord, and bring water, the dear God. We want to pray for the leaders of this world, Lord, that they may learn compassion and that they may learn justice, dear God, and that they may show humility, Lord, that they know that they too have to answer to a higher power than themselves. And Lord, we're especially pain and even angered and, and saddened by what we see happening in Ukraine, dear God. We pray for those people, Lord, the, 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 the demonic attack, Lord, that just leads to unspeakable suffering and pain, Lord, due to the madness of one individual. But Lord, you are a greater power than any one man. We ask that you go and bring peace, Lord, and bring a relief to all that suffering, dear God. Bless, Lord, and, and strengthen and guide and give a direction, Lord. And Lord, we pray for and pray for just the just just the the relief, Lord, of so much pain and suffering going on in this nation, dear God. The divisions, Lord. We pray for unity. We pray for wisdom. We pray for understanding, Lord. We ask that people learn to communicate with one another, to talk with one another, to share with one another. And dear God, we're placing it in your hands because nothing, Lord, is too hard for you. And we thank you for the promises of your word, Lord, that says, though the fig tree should not blossom and there is no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the field produce no food, though the flock should be cut from off the fold and there is no cattle in the stalls, and you says, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord is our strength and we're trusting in him. We're trusting in you, dear God. We ask these blessings, trust in your answer. In Jesus' name, amen. You, I have been richly blessed this evening. I hope that you have been encouraged and I look forward to see what God is going to do for us tomorrow night, Monday night at 7 o'clock p.m. Well, let's look to the Lord to be dismissed. Father, uh, we thank you so much, God, that we don't have to get stuck in fear, in doubt, and in depression, but God, that your power can be unleashed in us because he lives. Your power can, can root out those areas in our lives. So God, I ask even now that your Holy Spirit would work on our hearts and on our minds. God, keep this word fresh in our minds. But then also, God, help us not to keep it to ourselves. Please help us to share it with someone else. Father, I ask that you would keep all of us, watch over us, and protect us until we are able to come together again. And we ask all of these things in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Good night, everybody.